What's up, everybody? Special edition live Coast to Coast podcast here. Unannounced. I guess it was announced because Tommy posted it on the message boards. But, uh, you know, we try to make sure that we're breaking news as best we can and giving you guys um, you know, the, the quickest, best rundown of what's happening around Carolina basketball. So this is a special edition of the Coast to Coast podcast. I'm Joey Powell. We're brought to you by Johnny T-Shirt and our friends at Congruity. Sherell, yeah, yeah, easy for me to say. Sherell McMillan has joined me. And Sherell, I'm straight in from the ball field. I smell like fish tank rocks right now. I, I look like dust and um, run over butthole. But I am here with you to discuss a departure from uh, UNC's rotation from this past year in basketball. As Seth Trimble, the sophomore from Menominee Falls, Wisconsin, it only took me two years to say that right, has decided to enter his, na his name in the transfer portal and is heading uh, elsewhere. And I think we we knew, as we said on the show recently, uh, you said that you know Seth Tremble would be one of those players that had a decision to make. So first things first, um, share your insight as to kind of how this all materialized and we got to a point to where uh, Seth Tremble has decided to leave. I think the first thing, Joey, I, I'm going to answer your question. But the first thing I think we should uh, talk about is Seth Tremble as a player. Um, and really, I, I don't like to do this, but as a person, uh, I will. Hate losing recuse, this kid, man. Yeah, I will. I will somewhat recuse myself because I do have a very good relationship uh, with him and his family, and I, I do think he's a a really great kid. The type that uh, Heber Davis has talked about culture and fit over and over again, and I think Trimble kind of exemplifies that. So from that aspect, it it definitely is a loss for UNC, and I think on the court it's a loss for UNC uh, because Trimble was a player who could have left last year. Um, you know, when, when Cadeau came in and then there was the whole thing with Wiltshire, like he could have left and, and gone somewhere else, but he decided to stay <clears throat> to improve himself. And I think you saw with more playing time and with more work in the gym, he was a better player as a sophomore than he was a freshman. And it's, I think what's hurting Carolina fans a whole lot is that you kind of project that, next season another season of growth with his athleticism and then we talked about the kind of kid he is with the culture fit um and the willingness to do some things that maybe other people weren't and you could see why it is a a, a you know it's a big loss to carolina on the court and off it um i think why it happened um so i can say it's not because he didn't play in the second half against alabama so let's hang on a second. Right? Let's let's stop. I'm going to step on you because I do want to I want to stay with you and talk about Seth Trimble, the person, Seth Trimble, the player. <clears throat> I can absolutely understand the frustration from from fans uh, about losing him, because like you said, his you know, he, he's a bit of a legacy in the sense that his brother played at UNC, uh, just an all around great kid that put in the work and uh, was very, uh, very much a good teammate. And yeah, like you said, when you first started and I stepped on you then, my bad. It's just it's it's hard to see good kids leave the program. It's hard to see um, good players that you enjoy to cover leaving the program. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to echo that a little bit. I mean, it just he's he's matured so much and become became such a huge asset for this squad this past year. Uh, just in one year from you know from his freshman year to this year, you saw how valuable he was to the point that in the Alabama game, people were you know clamoring for why he wasn't playing the entire second half. So. Yeah, it's it's definitely definitely a bit of a sting for for IC subscribers and Tar Heel fans because you, you don't want to see a a player like this leave the family. Go ahead, please talk about how it developed. I'm sorry. Yeah, and I I think what you said is 100 percent accurate. You know, I I don't think or I know that it wasn't because he set the second half in Alabama. It wasn't that everything was great and then Alabama happened and he's like, you know what, I'm leaving. Like this stuff does take time it does happen over time did that exacerbate it potentially you know i think that'll be an answer we'll try to get moving forward um but when you start to look at it at, at its simplest form it's you know seth wants to play point guard he wants to be on the ball and right now carolina kind of has a point guard entrenched in elliot cadeau who by all accounts, is is returning for his sophomore season. So it is a situation where <clears throat> if Godot, um is going to get the minutes like he did at point guard last year, and there's the potential for R.J. Davis to come back, uh, he would get the minutes at the two, presumably. He's a 
Jerry West Award winner, first team All American, ACC Player of the Year, go down the list. Uh, and then they have Ian Jackson coming in as well. It was kind of like if the opportunity wasn't given to him now, would it come eventually? And I think that was the question that he and his family, you know, had for Hubert Davis and had for themselves. Um, I think we talked about how the end of year meetings are, they try to, both sides try to be brutally honest. I think um, it's one of those things with Coach Smith back in the day. It was like during the season, it's about the team. During the off season, it's about the individual. And so that's what those meetings were about was, you know, what, what's the vision? I think both sides uh, shared that, what their visions were. And usually when the visions don't align, that's when you get a player entering the transfer portal. And uh, that's kind of where I think things are with Seth. Or obviously he entered the portal, so that's where things are with him. I I think it's important to remind people too, you know, if you look right now, if you go to 24-7's transfer portal page and see every single program is losing players like this. Uh, You saw uh, uh, Omar Ballo from Arizona enter his name. I mean, that guy was a, a starter uh, an upperclassman or one of the best teams in the country. I mean, this just no one's uh, impervious to this new age in Carolina basketball or in college basketball. And and Seth is doing what's best for him. Um, and, yeah. and I like that, too. And Joey, I know people, it, it, it goes quickly to, well, I can't stay in the transfer portal and I can't right. stay in NIL. And it's easy to um, make the boogeyman. It's easy right. to have. You, you want something to trans to transfer your anger and your frustration to. I get that. That's natural. Right. It's human. You, but you, you can't say you dislike it when you love Harrison Ingram. You can't say you dislike it when you love Cormac Ryan. It goes both both ways. And you're going to lose great kids and you're going to get great kids. And that's just kind of the way it goes. Um, I think, you know, with, with Seth <laughs> moving forward, he's going to have a lot of suitors. I think we know that um, considering how he's improved each year, um, his pedigree coming out of high school. Uh, so, you know, there'll, there'll be a, a, a big market for him. Um, and I think, you know, it's good that players have choice. You wouldn't, if you were in a relationship, Joey, and you saw that it probably wasn't going to go where you wanted it to go, why should you be forced to stay in that relationship? It might be amicable when you split. It might be like, you know what, this just isn't working. Um, so why, sh- why, sh- why should you have to stay in that? Just because like, I don't know, we have this idea that staying in it makes you tougher. No, sometimes staying in it doesn't let you reach your goals. And sometimes staying in it can make you miserable. I don't think that's necessarily the case with Seth uh, about being miserable, but I think he wasn't going to be able to do what he wanted to do at UNC. And to his credit, he gave it two full years to to try to get there. And once he saw that it probably wasn't going to happen the third year, then he then he moved on. And that's not that's not anything against Hubert Davis. I think I don't think anything against Carolina. It's just yes. it's just one of those things, and it's just folks have to wrap their head around college basketball that now it is so much more transactional that's the word I've, I've heard from a lot of people so much more transactional than it used to be it, it was more of a you know let's talk about this type deal but when you have options which is a good thing then you need to take care of those options and and try to meet your goals so i think that's where it set this and and that's one of the reasons why you know he's moving on another important thing for people to think about with with seth is as a college player even with <clears throat> even with the COVID year and with the transfer portal, you still have a finite amount of time to develop yourself, showcase yourself before you're mandated to, to to take the next step to the next level. Like you can make all the jokes about Armando Baycott, you know, being at UNC for a decade and a half. But truth of the matter is there is a, a final grain of sand in the hourglass for these kids. And, uh, you know, for a player like Seth Trimble, like he, if he's going to showcase himself enough to capitalize on his ambitions uh, of making it to the next level, whether that be in the NBA, uh, playing in Europe, what have you, he's got to get the playing time to showcase that. And he's got to be able to get playing time to develop himself in places that maybe he sees a need for development. And and if, if that's not going to happen in North Carolina, no matter how much you enjoy the environment, love your teammates, uh, you've got to kind of play the long game here. And, and I, I would just, I would caution everybody to, as much as you may not like the new era of basketball and the way it is, it just is what it is. And and you saw that Seth Trimble had, had a, an incredible set of skills that's going to, as Cheryl mentioned, give him a lot of suitors. Uh, you know, I, I don't have any insights to where he's going to go, but I think right now, a kid from Wisconsin, uh, knowing the way that Marquette plays, I could see him being a huge asset to, to Shaka Smart's roster. Um, knowing that, you know, 
Wisconsin uh, plays in a league that doesn't like to score the ball, a player like Seth Trimble is going to absolutely be a terror uh, playing half court defense for somebody. So and both of those schools are back home. I have no idea if he's talked to them. I have no idea if those schools are interested or even if they have a scholarship available. But Seth Trimble in his limited minutes this year showed that he is absolutely ready to be a major contributor and a major player, pardon the pun, uh, in somebody's season. And, and just so happens that there's there's not enough minutes in North Carolina for him to get what he thinks he should get. And, and I think that's fair. All right. And this may be semantics, depending on the way you look at it, but this wasn't a, a Hubert Davis decision. Like, he didn't go to the meeting and say, we don't want you at Carolina. That's not how this happened. Seth made a decision, a mature decision on his own that he thought moving on was the best for him. And I think everyone can respect that when you when you feel like you're in a situation where you need to get better and it's not at where you are, you can move on. I think everyone can respect that. So it's, I, I, I don't want people to think that, like, why didn't Hubert Davis try to keep him? Obviously, he did. I, I can share this now. I think it's been a year. But when the season ended last year uh, after the NIT and all that stuff, you know, we were sourcing information, trying to figure out who was what and what was going to happen. And pretty early on, we were told that there were a certain number of players. I, I, I won't give the number, but I'll say that Seth was one of them that was an absolute have to have back, you know, by any means necessary. And so it's not as if UNC didn't value him. I think maybe, again, how much they valued him and how much, you know, he valued what he did and the, the gap in between those two things maybe is where the, the differences lie in, in the reason he's transferring. But uh, again, that's kind of college basketball now. And I think moving it forward for UNC, as much as, you know, everyone likes Seth, Carolina now has an opportunity to change the roster um it, improve maybe is it, difficult for me considering what you know how i feel about what seth brought but uh improve slash change the roster through the portal the same way that they did last year um you know it it takes players and it gives players too so that's that's the good thing i guess about the portal i'll throw this out to you Cheryl, before we start talking about what comes next at, at that position um for the folks that you know are, are frustrated about the situation I understand the emotion. I would say if it goes farther than just a surface level emotion, I would ask this question. What could Hubert Davis or Seth Trimble, what should they have done differently? And I don't think there's, I don't think there's an answer to that, right? Like, I don't think there's a realistic answer for that. And I think that's, that's basically where folks should walk away. Like, it's just not, it's, it, it, it can't work here. And if it can't work here, then, you know, everybody's got to do what's best for themselves. And so again, I, Real talk, Cheryl. I'm gonna root like hell for that kid wherever he goes. I mean, like oh, yeah. he could he could be wearing a he could be wearing a you know ISIS Tech shirt next year, and I would I would have a hard time not pulling for him because he's he's that good of a kid and that from that you know that nice of a family. And I didn't have half the role with them that that you did, obviously. So you mentioned it, um, and shout out to the 500 folks that are in here with us live tonight on a random Tuesday talking about. Uh, you know, North Carolina's first man off the bench, uh, Seth Tremble, uh, Menominee Falls, Wisconsin, departing the program. Uh, appreciate all y'all being here. Sherelle, what's next? Right. Obviously, there is now a, a scholarship open that, um, you yeah, know, that that wasn't definitively open prior to today. So what do you think uh, Hubert Davis's strategy may be moving toward or moving forward with uh, with having this this scholarship available for Seth Trimble? I'll answer that one second, but I see a comment I want to respond to. It, it says uh, from Emory Ashley, it says, I get that this may be the best decision for Seth, but is this the best for UNC? It, whether or not it's the best for UNC shouldn't factor into Seth's decision making. Um, again, the off season is about the player, in season is about the team. And I think he held his end of the bargain up pretty good. So I, I don't think the two really mesh, like the, the question whether those two are, are congruent, I, I don't think really matters. Um, but as far as what's next, you know, I, I think we've shared on the premium board for those who aren't subscribers, please go subscribe. Uh, kind of the wait, 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 wait. For those of you go who ahead. aren't subscribers, for those of you who aren't subscribers but are in a live podcast talking about somebody entering the transfer portal, let's all take a second and judge those people silently. Okay. Judgment over. Continue, sir. 
Yeah, so we've shared kind of uh, portal names to know or, or folks that they have uh, contacted. And I think we'll see exactly what they want to do in the backcourt. Again, I, a lot of this hinges on what RJ Davis decides. Right now, as things stand, if RJ were to leave, then Elliot Godot, presuming he's back, which we think he is, and Ian Jackson would kind of be the only guards on the roster. I think Drake Powell uh, could play some at the two, but that's a really thin backcourt. Now, if RJ Davis decides to return, then you have a situation where you're basically just subbing out uh, Seth Trimble for Ian Jackson is from a rotation standpoint. Because last year, you know, there were three guards and they played almost 100% of the minutes. Not not quite, but, uh, you know, Wojcik played probably the first eight or nine games, pretty significant minutes, and then not much, basically until Alabama. Uh, when, so it, when it went over to Cadeau, essentially that was Wojcik's minutes. Right, right. So it was, it was, it was Cadeau, uh, Davis, and Trimble in the backward for the majority of the time. So with no additions and presume RJ were to return, then you kind of have a similar three guard rotation. Now, if Davis leaves, then obviously they're going to have to go into the portal and, and get a guard. Uh, I, I don't think we'll know the answer to that for a little bit. So that's kind of where things stand. I think we're still a lot of stuff hinges on the overall roster on the decisions of Harrison Ingram and RJ Davis. So that that's kind of where things stand. Um, <clears throat> I would caution for those of you who don't, normally listen to coast to coast my favorite portal saying when it comes to unc is that silence does not mean in action uh so they are doing stuff just hubert davis and really going back to Roy williams they they have decided or, or or made a choice that they're going to operate very quietly and we'll find stuff out when we find stuff out now part of our job <clears throat> is to find some of that stuff out and i think we do a decent job of that but we can't find out everything so there are players, more than likely, outside of the ones that we've introduced as portal names to know that they are talking to. And as we're able to confirm that, we'll, we'll share it. But uh, a lot going on, still some moving pieces, uh, especially with RJ Davis and Harrison Ingram. And then uh, with some of the names to know and whether or not those guys take visits and how quickly they want their recruitment, recruitments to go. Um, so a, a lot to be done. Uh, important dates to remember, Joey, since, again, we're kind of going over everything. May 1st is when the transfer portal closes. So that does not mean that players who are entered have to make a decision by then. They just have to have their names into the portal by then. So that should be, if you're looking at this as kind of a, um, on a line, on a timeline, May 1st is the first time you should take a snapshot and say, okay, this might be what the Carolina roster looks like because then you'll know uh, none of the undergraduates can transfer out um, and they should be there. So that's that's the first step. After that, the NBA Combine and the G League Combine are in mid-May, uh, the same week that coaches can be uh, on the road for EYBL and Adidas and all the AAU tournaments. So that's, an, that's another kind of moment in time because if a player is in the draft and doesn't perform well at the Combine or the G League Combine, they have until the end of May to withdraw from the NBA draft which is how Carolina got involved with players like uh, Matthew Mayer from Baylor, Pete Nance, who ended up committing, Dawson Garcia, who ended up committing. All those guys had went through the pre-draft process and pulled their names out towards the end. Um, so after, I guess it's May 30th, there's another group of players who probably could become available. So they will entertain those. Then mid-June, uh, when the second summer session starts, typically – the Father's, week after Day. Father's Day, the week after Father's Day, that's when you can take another snapshot and say, all right, these 10 or 11 or 12 or however many guys it is are on campus. Um, after that, it's not quite final because there are still some players who could enter because of coach firings or or resignations or whatever. Uh, after that is basically fall class starts, and that is in late August. That's when. We are 100% sure, no doubt about it, what the roster will look like. Uh, so each moment in time, May 1st, June 1st, let's just call it June 24th, those are the dates you need to look at to take snapshots. That's, uh, and, and y'all, I would, I would encourage you as this drops to your podcast feed tomorrow, go back and listen to everything Sherelle just laid out. Obviously, we'll, we'll go over that a thousand times uh, over our next episodes of the Coast to Coast. But I want you guys to make sure you understand the the timeline that Cheryl laid out because I think it's 
it's important that everybody recognizes the kind of the the watermarks that you have along the way. Um, yeah, I, I made the I made the joke. Um, I guess on this show maybe uh, a while back. I mean, it's you're looking at uh, still probably another couple of weeks before you even know who all is going to be transferring because of when the portal closes. Keep in mind, y'all, the the season just ended last night officially. So there's there's a lot of names that are still deciding whether or not they want to transfer or if, if that's in the cards for them and, and coaches carousels are are rotating and spinning and John Calipari may have decided to get on another jet ski and go somewhere else. Who knows, right? So um there's a lot of moving parts here. So as much as as we're used to this instant gratification and knowing things immediately, hang tight, just be patient, and uh, and just wait and see. Um, yeah, Sherelle's, Sherelle's timeline is a great one, but definitely uh, this is most likely not going to be a microwave process if we've learned anything from how Hubert Davis and his staff like to operate. Also, shout out to the 617 of you that are with us right now. I was going to say, Joey, I, I think we have good chemistry, so I hope you're following me here, but if you were John Calipari, you just got the job at Arkansas and you wanted to kind of look at your organization and figure out, you know, what's best for it, what would you do? I mean, the first thing I would do is is I would sit down, make sure I've got a good internet connection. I would go to Congruity HR uh, and, and see what that website might be able to tell me as far as efficiency, um, availability, uh, just kind of looking to see what they might be able to do to help my program. Um, you know, and I'm I'm not sure if if Congruity HR has a thing that's like, you know, Congruity HR forward slash Tar Heels. I don't know if Congruity HR forward slash Razorbacks or forward slash Woo Pig Suey or forward slash Tyson Chicken is good for me. I don't know. I don't know if any of those things are real. But I do know that Congruity HR forward slash Tar Heels is real. And if you are listening to this show, you should go check it out, especially if you own or operate a small or medium-sized business. Those guys will absolutely take care of you. They're going to help you understand where you may be able to optimize your organization. They might take you, help you take a look at your roster, if you will, Sherelle, and see where your deficiencies may be, right? Then you could actually take another look and see, hmm, could we be better if we maybe had this player do these things and maybe had another player do things that are their strengths so that I, the coach, could focus on coaching. Just saying. Congruity HR, big sponsor of this show. We appreciate them. We want you to, to hit them up too. Um, because if I'm if I'm John Calipari and I've got wheels down in in Fayetteville, Arkansas right now, first off, it's it's cl- you know, head and shoulders below the best Fayetteville in the world, which is the one in North Carolina. But you know, you're in a second rate Fayetteville, at least get yourself some first rate HR guidance. Um, and maybe they can take care of you. Uh, Cheryl, I love that, man. You set them up. I'll knock them down every time. Uh, so next phase, you know, you mentioned that UNC is, is moving slowly. I'll, I'll, I'll let you, I'll let you hit this before we get out of here. Um, UNC moving slowly may seem slow to fans, but realistically, like how long do these processes take? I think it's important to show now that we've got three years of seeing how this transfer portal works explain to people how long the process may take, whether a kid takes a visit or not, right? Like all of the machinations and the movement that has to happen. Tell folks that just because they see such and such a name in the portal today doesn't mean that, you know, he's on UNC's campus tomorrow. Help them understand on average, like how North Carolina, what what things have to happen. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's a couple of things. It varies by player. Some players are on campus one day and committed the next. Uh, I think uh, Paxton Wojcik, for example, we got wind that he was visiting, I think it was a Sunday afternoon, and Tuesday morning he has a commitment graphic up that he's going to UNC. So that one, even though we don't know exactly when he started talking to UNC, that one moved very, very quickly. I think there are some uh, where they might have pro aspirations, like we mentioned before. Um, They might... Uh, be looking at other schools and, and might want to take visits. Um, they might want to get to know the coaching staff a little bit better through multiple phone calls and Zoom calls and in-person meetings and, and all those good things. Um, so some can last months, some can last a few days. And I think the UNC staff just has to, or what they've gotten good at is making sure they know kind of what each player is looking for and then catering what they do towards that. 
Um, the other thing is you you always you don't ever want to go too soon, but you don't want to wait too long. So trying to thread that needle between, you know, what's in the portal on March 31st might not be um, the best that's going to be in the portal, but you don't know that on March 31st. You you think you think it might be the best, but there could be a name that comes out of left field all the way back to Dawson Garcia. And I know folks think that because of the way it ended with Dawson Garcia, that that wasn't a home run for UNC. But that's the example I keep using is because everybody was like, well, why isn't UNC using the last scholarship? And it's like, well, you just need to wait and see and keep your options open just in case an amazing player, uh, you know, Joey Five Star, who's a 6'7", 250, but can run a 4'240 and has a 49-inch vertical leap and shoots 50% from three, comes into the portal. If you have 13 scholarships and you've already taken, you know, Michael Lewis from, uh, you know, Terry Sanford High School, then you're in trouble. Because Michael Lewis Michael Lewis is boo-boo, but go ahead. Well, he he went to Terry Sanford, so That's naturally. a good point. Fair enough. Uh, uh, speaking of the real Fayetteville. Uh, so I, I think it's just a matter of threading that needle between making sure that you're on top of your targets and that you're being aggressive, but not too aggressive just in case there's something – I hate to say better, but there's a, a player, a superior player who enters later. So they're they're trying to manage all that. Uh, they're trying to manage now in this process agents, which weren't a thing, uh, you know, four, even three or four years ago. Uh, so they're managing agents. They're always managing families and friends. So it's a very complicated process, but one in which I think they've grown over the last three years and have a better understanding of, of kind of how to do things and how to put things together. And if you listen to Hubert Davis's comments, I think uh, not maybe above all else because you have to be able to play. Like Roy Williams would say, like you can be a bum, <laughs> you can't be a bum and come play at Carolina. But if you're talented and all things are equal, they're going to take the guy who fits better and uh, who will engross himself, embed himself in in the Carolina culture for however long he's there. And I think uh, Harrison Ingram and Cormac Ryan and Paxton Wojcik and Jalen Withers have uh, really even made that a stronger uh, thing for Hebrew Davis to look for because he t he's talked about how important that was last year, how it's helped him, how it helped the team. So trying to measure all that, uh, whether it's within three days or within uh, 45 days is, is what the coaching staff is doing now. Remember last year or the first few years of the portal was 60 days. So even this year is condensed and truncated compared to what it was. I also think it's important for folks to, to recognize, you know, Hubert Davis probably is going to take the chemistry that he had on this roster and try to replicate it as best he can. I think he realizes that um, he found his groove this year in the types of players that he brought in. And I don't mean skill sets like Sherelle was saying. I mean, like human beings and, and people off the court that fit this locker room and fit this culture. I think that uh, he's probably going to try to to stick with that recipe because the the soup was was fairly good. If if folks will remember, aside of the wins and losses, this was a fun team that that got along well and was incredibly coachable. Oh, and by the way, they had some success. Um, I mean, he, Sherelle, he, he he literally said this team gave him faith that you know you could still put together a college program. So he could do it. it yeah. So to think that that's not going to have a major impact on the types of players um, and and. Uh, that they recruit in the portal moving forward, yep. that would be that'd be unwise because it's going to have a major impact. Yep. So I would all of those things I would file away as you're as you're, as you're watching this. We know all of you in the in the chat right now will be following along. Um, we appreciate y'all being here tonight, Cheryl. There's there's one thing I want to say before we get out of here. Um, yeah, and this has been a special edition of the Coast to Coast podcast, talking about Seth Trimble entering the transfer portal. I'm going to bet before he leaves campus, Seth Trimble goes back to Johnny T-shirt. I mean, I, I would just assume that he goes back one more time and makes a huge clean sweep of their amazing, uh, amazing selection of, of UNC swag and uh, gear and, and memorabilia and, and what have you, because you're not going to find that anywhere else in America. Johnny T-shirt is one of a kind, just like Chapel Hill is one of a kind. Um, Johnny T-shirt dot com right there on East Franklin Street in Chapel Hill. Baseball team has some home games coming up soon. So if you're around. Um, maybe I'll run into you because I'm absolutely a fiend for Johnny T. Johnny T shirt.com premium subscribers know you get that extra 10% off the top. Sherelle, we're going to land the plane in under 30 minutes tonight. I appreciate you being here. Uh, Seth Trimble departing Chapel Hill for a better situation for himself. And certainly he'll be, uh, he'll be missed at least from 
from our standpoint because he was uh, he was a fun cover. But hoping things go well for him in the future, we wish him all the best. Thanks to everybody for making us a part of your evening. Uh, if you joined us live on YouTube or if you uh, if you got us in your in your podcast feeds later on, we're we're appreciative of you being here. Uh, as always, we're brought to you by Congruity Johnny T shirt for Sherelle McMillan. Uh, shout out to John Siegley for producing. I'm just Joey Powell. We'll talk to you next time on InsideCarolina.com.